So here we are at uh, the end of a most beautiful day. We had the first edition of uh, Vox Days in Yash. So let's have a big round of applause for the organizers who did that. So thank you. Oh, click the wrong button. Right? And at the end of this beautiful day, I'll try to prolong it just a little bit yeah, by talking about future proof development with GitHub Code Spaces, Copilot, and GPT 4. Oh boy, that's because you cannot have too many words on a title. This, this is what I learned when doing this. Um, so at this point, you're probably asking, uh, who is this guy? Oh, nice to meet you. I'm Vlad Iliescu. I uh, work at a software company in Yash called Strongbytes. I also act as CTO at uh, Energy.ai, a startup I've co-founded where um, we're forecasting energy prices. And I'm also a Microsoft most valuable professional on AI. So that, that's a bit of a list of credentials. And you know, myself, whenever I see a long list of credentials, I, I think about the, the Wizard of Oz. You know, when, uh, when the scarecrow, all, all he wanted was a brain and he got a diploma. So, so I'll try to share with you a bit more than just credentials. Right? Uh, I'll share with you my two biggest fears. That's deep stuff. Right? So number one, it's spiders. Screw those. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in the country and there was nothing left to do over there. I, I would keep going into the shed. There was one of th two of these guys just waiting to pounce on me. And uh, luckily, none of them were radioactive. So uh, I'm here now. Right? That's fear number one. And fear number two, well, I get to that in a moment, but uh, does anybody know what this object is? Yeah, and those who, who think they know, th this is not a rendering of a save button. Yeah, you, you do know that, <laughs> right? So, so, uh, right, so, so this, is, uh, this was, is, exists. The original USB sticks, yeah, well, you, can, you could carry around 1.45 megabytes on one of these babies. And uh, yeah, surprisingly, they, they aren't uh, found anywhere today. Yeah. So you might, sorry? Yeah, that <laughs> depends on where you look for them, of course. Uh, I, I didn't mean Silk Road. <laughs> um, right? But you, you might say they are irrelevant, right? So this is also one of my, uh, my biggest fears, that of becoming irrelevant. And I, I can pinpoint uh, the time where it started. It started when, just when I saw that everybody was ditching monoliths and starting to go into microservices, and I just couldn't understand why. You know, but everybody loved those. But right now, yeah, people are going back from microservices to monoliths. You know, Prime Video just switched from, from AWS Lambda to a monolith, and they cut something like 90% of their costs, which is funny. Uh, right, but, but I, I do fear of becoming irrelevant, so I started thinking about, OK, what could I learn today that will be relevant in uh, yeah, two years, five years, 10 years? And uh, the obvious answer is, of course, Docker. But everybody talks about that. So uh, I want to talk. <laughs> about something else, and also to research something else, right? So um, to me, it does feel like everybody, or a lot of people, are moving their workloads into the cloud, right? Because why wouldn't you enter your personal data on another machine? Yeah, so, so cloud IDs seem to be getting traction. Uh, there are a lot of offerings over there. Um, and yeah, today I'll show you one of them. That's one. And AI-assisted development, well, that's easy. All the blockchain experts that I used to follow for investment advice suddenly became AI experts that I now follow for AI advice. So obviously, this is the next big thing, right? Sorry? That's always a good sign. Follow the money. <laughs> yeah? So uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, these, these two trends. And uh, you know, I think just talking uh, in an abstract fashion is yeah, not, uh, not necessarily exciting. So I'll, uh, I'll demo a few of those prod products, yeah? So first, but first, let's talk about cloud IDEs, right? And I'm sorry about the font, right? But, but you might think, some peop other people might think uh, of a cloud IDE, like, like a, I don't know, a VM somewhere in the cloud, that you install some things, you have source control, you have build, uh, build environment, whatever, you remote desktop into it, you do your work, then you shut it down, whatever. That, 
Does anybody here believe that? Few, because otherwise this slide would have been a disaster. Yeah, we don't mean this by using a cloud IDE, right? What we do mean is yeah, a full development environment in the browser, right? It's the difference between having a v, uh, running an application on a VM, right, and running it on something like uh, an Azure App Service or AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Right? It's platform as a service, and I, I, I don't want to bother with setting up another machine. Please, I have something else to do. Right? So, so this is what I mean by a cloud ID, you, and it has some advantages. Right? It's, it's faster to use. You get the same environment um, for all team members, and it's, it's just cool to say I'm developing in the cloud. Right? So uh, there are a, a couple. Uh, a lot of offering over here, offerings over here. Coincidentally, at Microsoft Build, Microsoft announced just yesterday night, evening, uh, that they're launching a new <laughs> uh, Cloud ID type of machine, DevBox, from July. So, so everybody's doing that, right? But myself, I'm going to fo focus on uh, GitHub code spaces. Uh, I really like this, not because it's, uh, it's free, because it's, it's not necessarily free, but you do get uh, a certain uh, amount of free hours, let's say, but because it's, it's, really use, uh, sorry, it's really easy to use and set up. Yeah? Uh, and I wanted to show you a, a quick demo, if that's okay. And um, just so you know, I originally intended to, to do these uh, demos as live, but then I figured what if a disaster happens. So I pre-recorded them. I pre-recorded all of them except the last one, which would be funny if it were a disaster. That's GPT-4. Yeah? So <laughs> and we all know it's going to be a disaster. Right. Uh, so ooh, I'm going to click, and now I can pause on pause with the power of space. Right. So um, what is this? This is a GitHub repository. Can you see any of the text? I, I cannot distinguish it very well, but can you? That's good. <laughs> that, 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 that peachy. Um, happy to hear that. So, brilliant. Did you do something or it was just... Thank you. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, this is a GitHub repository of mine. Um, and I'm going to start a new code space on it. Now, check this out. So, I'm not cloning it. Right, locally. I'm just clicking uh, a nice plus button in, uh, in a UI. And at this moment, a new virtual machine, fresh from the oven, is being created, configured based on the, well, on some files I've put in the repository, of course, and getting ready for, for me to use it. And I actually didn't edit this for speed. It takes around 40 to 50 seconds to do. I wanted uh, you to see how fast it is. So it's not starting an, uh, an existing machine, right? It's creating a new machine, starting it, preparing and setting it up, and boom, you have an instance. If you can't figure it out because of the way the text is displayed, this is Visual Studio Code running in a browser. Yeah, so, so it's already there, it started. And it says, welcome to Code Spaces. You are on a custom image defined in your dev container JSON file. Well, this is brilliant, right? That was fast. And what is this dev container files, uh, file? Has anybody used those so far? You should, right? <laughs> the, um, these are, uh, wow, the text is really bad. Could I, can I do something to, to improve the text? Kind sir. No, that's a negative. Can I do something to improve the text? Bigger. Uh, that's that's. The, the issue is that this is a movie, so it's it's not. Ah, make it bigger in the ID. That's that's a great piece of advice. Yes, it works. Thank you. You obviously done this before. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, right. So, so basically, this dev container JSON file is an open technology. You can use it on your own machine without having to resort to code spaces. And it's used to configure Docker containers 
for development pur purposes, right? So this is really cool. This, this means that even if you're not choosing code spaces, you can still have the same environment for all members of a team, right? If you want to install Docker on your machine, of course. Right, so, so we have a, a couple of uh, options over here. Yeah, you can see I'm setting a, an image and I'm using, due to the fact that this is a, a job, mostly a Java focus conference, I picked Python. I'm funny like that. I could have Pixie Sharp. Yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> I'm, apart from the fact that I'm uh, configuring right, a base Docker image, I'm also forwarding some ports. You'll see why in a moment. Hint, it's a microservice. But also running some, uh, some post-creation commands, such as pip install requirements. These are the requirements. Installing some modules over there. And also installing a couple of Visual Studio Code extensions, right? So this ensures that all people opening up my project in a code space or in a dev container have these extensions up and ready to use, right? Which is not bad. So I, I'll zoom out. Uh -huh. I was just so showing the, the extensions that have been installed in VS Code. Again, this is VS Code running in the browser. I should zoom out even more. Ha. And of course, there's this uh, main pie thing. This is my mighty microservice. I won't go into this very much. Uh, we'll see that a bit later. But basically, th this just uh, has an in-memory data store. It uh, puts data in there and uh, reads it. No, it's nothing big. Right, so, so I'm going to run this right now. And you can see it's listening on port 8000 locally. And lo and behold, this is port 8000. Yeah, I have a list of ports on which the app is listening. So, so what did I do? Uh, if you can see it, that one says, hello world. Right, so, so I started an application on my code space. Then I opened up that link in the browser, and I can see the, the outputs of the, the application that was running in, a, in the code space. Right? Which sounds like a security issue. Right? So, and uh, also, it's, it has a um, swagger UI. The, uh, the reason for why this isn't actually a security issue is that, on the one hand, I asked it to forward the port 8000, right? You saw that in the dev container. Plus, by default, it only works if you're authenticated, right? So in the browser, I had my GitHub uh, profile on. I was logged in. But if I try to do it here, over here with curl, you can see I get a 302 found. Yeah, I don't get the hello world. Yeah, it, it's, ask, it's asking for a password. So how do I fix this? Yeah, well, I fix this in, in quite a simple way, to be, to be honest. I set it as public. Yeah, I, I can set the port visibility to, to public. And just like this, I can share uh, things with my colleagues. So for example, I love that this enables, you know, ha have you worked with uh, somebody, anybody? Um, and wanted to, to show them what you were working on, right? You were developing a, a fancy web service on a fancy branch that did, you didn't want to commit, right? And you wanted them to see how that looked like. Yeah, how, how did you do it? You, sorry? Sh sh wow, wow, I didn't think of that. Yeah, but what if they, ah, unagi. But what if they wanted to integrate with your API just to test it? Do you? Interesting. Well, let's imagine you don't do that. <laughs> yeah, let's imagine you actually want, <laughs> without giving control of the screen, we don't do that, <laughs> right? Uh, to, to, expo poor, uh, to expose this, uh, this API to, to them, right? An idea would be to just create a staging environment, deploy this to the staging environment, make sure nobody else's changes are on the staging environment, and so on, make sure you don't have any conflicts. Right? Th that sounds complicated. Another uh, option would be you know, just to commit, wait until they get your uh, version of the code, wait until they set up your environment, because maybe they don't use JavaScript. Who uses JavaScript? Right? And it, it sounds painful, painful, whereas in this scenario, all you have to do is create a new code space, run the service on the code space, make the port public, hope for the best, and give that person the link. Right? 
GitHub does it. Right? So you can see that now the message is hello world. It works. Now, I wanted to show you uh, a few more things. Yeah, this, this isn't by any measure a comprehensive review. I just wanted to, to whet your appetite. Yeah. So, by the way, this is my running code space. You can see I have another code space that's not running. And each, each machine has their own version of the code and is integrated with, with my repo. Uh, on the one hand, I wanted to show you that you can also change the machine type. Right? So right now, I'm running on the cheapest machine, also the least powerful. Now you can ask for more powerful machines, and if you're lucky, you'll get access. I haven't. Um, but also, and this is really cool, in case, just in case you don't want to yeah, work in the browser, you can open this code in a local ID, right? And it's, of course, it's Visual Studio Code. Everybody uses Visual Studio Code. But it's also JetBrains. I'm really excited about JetBrains. I, I'm a big fan of JetBrains products, to be honest. Uh, so you can use those to edit the code on the code space. And I'll show you how this works for, for Visual Studio. Yes, I do want to open this in, in VS Code. And right now, yeah, this is starting. This is my local running instance of VS Code for desktop. It's opening the machine. It's synchronizing. And I get access to, to everything I, I did before, right? So I, because personally, I don't know about you, but I don't like running code in a browser. I don't like, I'm not a fan of editing that. But I do like my, uh, my desktop IDs, right? Okay. Right now, I, I, I could show you this just a bit more, but in the interest of time, and uh, yeah, so as not to, to go to sleep, I'm going to click Next. And notice that it doesn't work. Zoom out, click Next. So what do you think after this very, very, very light introduction? Would you use it? Yeah. OK, would you not use it? Would you not raise your hand? <laughs> right? So uh, luckily, more people would use it than, than not. But uh, I also wanted to, to highlight a few pros and cons for it. Right? So, so <laughs> now, now to the left. <laughs> right, thanks. So, so on the one hand, it's cool that you can access this from, from any device. For example, you can program on your phone. Who does that? Or on an iPad, which, yeah, but really, it's pain. Who does that? Right, but you can run code that you wouldn't be able to run locally. Or, in my case, you can install JavaScript frameworks and run NPM install on something else than your um, machine. Because you don't want, don't want to mess it up. Right? So, so it's a cloud-based development uh, environment. It has pre-configured containers, so, so that, that's a big one. It ensures all, uh, all the team has the same development environment. And what I love, you have Visual Studio Code, you have JetBrains, IDEs, it's great. However, what I do not love, and I don't think you need to scroll, uh, <laughs> you kind of need an internet connection, right? So de depending on the use case, that may or may not be relevant. But in some cases, yeah, it, might, it might hurt that you can't access the, the internet. Also. It's, it's not exactly expensive. So, so um, sorry, I, I meant to say it's not exactly cheap, but <laughs> that's what I meant. So, basically, uh, a GitHub free subscriber has something like 120 core hours included per month. So that, that means, because the lightest machine has two cores, that means you get around 60 hours. Then you need to pay, and uh, you, you pay something like $0.09 per core. So, yeah, it, you, you might end up paying something like $14 per week, which, yeah, depends. Your mileage may vary. That, to me, might, uh, yeah, it, it's not ex that uh, enticing, let's say. But to be honest, I, now, uh, I, I was expecting way less from, uh, from Cloud IDs before I started doing this. And uh, yeah, it's quite impressive. I'm looking forward to see what comes out in a couple of years. Yes. Uh, yes, you, you're... <laughs> so, so the question is, if I connect to a code space through VS Code locally or JetBrains, whatever, and I have someone save changes, yeah. 
and the internet connection drops. Well, I haven't tried that, to be honest. I would expect it to keep a local cache of at least the file you're editing, but if not, do not sue me. <laughs> I find that really important to you. <laughs> right. Uh, now, let, let's, let's talk a bit. That, that, that was about Cloud ID. So, exciting. Maybe it will be more exciting in a couple of years right now. But uh, what, what might be exciting right now is AI assistant development. And I, I've been thinking about uh, AI assistant, AI assisted development for, for a couple of years. For example, this is a screenshot of, uh, of an article I wrote two years ago about GitHub Copilot. And I, I find that its pros and cons have mainly stayed the same. So um, one thing I learned while preparing this, should I put it back? Yeah. One thing I learned while preparing this talk is that I'm the kind of guy who quotes himself. So <laughs> I'm going to read this. Yeah, I, I was saying that I'm convinced that in three to five years, so that leaves us uh, around one year to start. Yeah, we'll all be writing a lot more comments. We'll be using a lot more descriptive names. And generally, just uh, trying to influence our AI-assisted brothers and sisters to, to help us write things. And you can see a screenshot here. I, I wanted to say a whole, whole lot less code. Copilot um, auto-completed a whole lot more code. And now I realize it was right for, for reasons I will get to, into it um, at, uh, later on, just a bit. And I, I do believe we'll need to do code reviews because, uh, well, you'll see, you'll see why in a moment. Right. Again, there are several offerings over here. There's tab 9. Hugging Face just launched something this week and hugging phase are really cool. I'm going to focus on Copilot because, well, I, I, I think that's, that's the best of the, current gen of, well, the current previous generation. And I'm really excited about uh, what they come up in the next uh, iterations. So this is another movie that's pixelated until you zoom in. Yeah, I know. I know. Believe me. Right? I shall click Start. It starts. And right now, off screen, I'm creating a new file. So, so basically, what is this? What are we looking at? This is the initial version of the Microsoft service I was running in the code space, right? Because turns out I developed that with Copilot. And I'll show you how I did that, and I'll show you how it works, basically. But uh, just before I do that, I wanted to know who here doesn't know what GitHub Copilot is and does? All right, it's a cool thing, it's a very cool thing. You should totally see it. <laughs> so, so, so it's like IntelliSense, but on steroids, right? It's, it's like autocomplete, but instead of autocompleting words, you autocomplete everything. Yeah, lines, paragraphs, blocks. Um, you'll see it in action, right? So right now, what, what, what do I want? I want to create a new item class to encapsulate my data that I'm gonna read and write with my API. And right now, I'm going to use a, a library called Pydantic. And you can see that autocomplete, that's autopilot, telling me to, yeah, it expects me to import a class name based model, which, ah, I zoomed in and now I need to zoom out because, right? So I'm going to define this class. And you can see I already started I, I it, right? And it Determine it, uh, it infers I wanted to create an item class, inherit base model, create a name price, and uh, a property determining whether or not it's on offer, which is almost accurate. I do want it to, to determine this, but uh, I wanted the description. And ever since I start writing this, it infers that I indeed want to create a description of type string, which is nullable which was quite fast, right? I didn't have to type a lot. So, so right now, I'm going to define a data store, right? A data store, just a dictionary, nothing much, right? And my dictionary should have numeric keys, and it should contain items. Now, you see, this is not the item class I'm using. This is not the item class I've defined earlier. It knows to, to recommend an item cl class because it it, it has my context. It knows which files I've opened recently. But it still messes things up, because I haven't defined an ID. And 
I changed is offered to description. So you need to pay attention to what you're doing. You need to pay attention to what you're accepting, which are the suggestions you're accepting, right? So I'm going to change this to just name, and it suggest, helpfully it suggests foo. And then it goes to bar, and the description is somehow the bartenders. I don't know why. And of course, Baz is not the bartenders, because <laughs> that definitely makes sense. And it did that without having to import the class. Yeah, so this wouldn't have compiled. So now I'm going to start, and again, this hasn't been edited for speed. I'm going to start defining properties. And the first thing that I wanted to, to do was, you know, not use the in-memory data store. I wanted to show you how to read from SQLite, how easy it is to use Copilot to read from SQLite. And you notice this is not reading from SQLite. Yeah. Can, can, can you see this? It says return data, data store, which isn't SQLite. So I tried to tell it, no, the real SQL database. Return data store. No, which is SQLite. And of course, it, it's, it's very single, uh, single track mind. So at this point, I decide, OK, sure, in memory data store, this is what we're using. This is what we're going to demo. Right? If you can't beat them, join them. Uh, right? So also, let's, let's create something. I'm going to do a post. And you see, it, def it infers that it should create a new item. Create item in memory data store, and then it just returns the item. Why? Who does that? Return item. All right, let's, let's try giving it some hints. Add, return item. It's persistent, insert. And at this point, I started believing it. <laughs> it's meant create. Yes, those are all synonyms, aren't they? So uh, I, <laughs> I found that it helps to, to think about Copilot like Igor from Young Frankenstein. Yes, master. Then goes off and do, does something else. But it's not the poor guy's fault, right? It doesn't know any better. It's, it's an older model. So what did I do? I tried telling it step by step. OK, in order to, return a, to add a new item, let's create an item ID. And it helpfully suggests that the item ID should be the length of the data store, which is you know, incorrect. Because th that would uh, mean that if I have an ID of 10, but just four items in the data store, the next ID would be five. And you, you would get all sorts of. Uh, bad thing, so we should use the maximum of the current keys. But once I go to the max, it helpfully decides that, yes, I'll help the guy. And at this point, I, I tried, OK, let's give, the, give it a thumbs up, because it, it's worked so hard, right? And, and so on and so off, right? So th this is, this is kind of how, how Copilot works, right? So, so you can see. It's really helpful. So I, I could do some very simple things, like really fast, really easy. And I could not do some other very simple things, like at all. Yeah. So it, your mileage may vary, right? I'm going to skip this. What do you think? Would you use it? Maybe. Why? You, you've used it. <laughs> Making the little guy failed. Well, yeah, yeah. The, the issue with the current iteration of Copilot is that it's based on an older codex model, right? Which, as far as I know, OpenAI is, is retiring them because ChatGPT, well, GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4 are, are significantly better at generating code as well. So, so that's, that's a bit of an issue with, with the current version of Copilot. I, I know a new version is coming up. From what I've seen, it's great, but I shouldn't be talking about this because I'm not allowed to. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about <laughs> what we can access without an NDA. Um, a couple, some, some advantages I see, right? You do get to write code faster. When it works, it's really fast. Yeah, especially for, for simple stuff. Uh, you can even write comments. You've seen when I started the comment to, to give it a thumbs up, it started explaining what it was doing. And, and you can actually ask it to generate comments for blocks of code. This code does this, and it will helpfully fill that in. And again, it was not just in VS Code, also in JetBrains. I, I repeat that because I'm, I'm a big fan of 
I'll shut up about it. But they're great, to be honest. They don't pay me to say that, but they should. Right? Uh, on the other hand, man, that was distracting. Right? So, so if you try to think a bit about what you're writing, it keeps on filling up stuff. Right? And okay, but I, I, I want to think. I don't. I don't want to be just, uh, you know, a mindless machine that says yes, no, yes, no, that's good, that doesn't seem good. I, 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 and at times it's, it's just annoying. But yeah, there's a cure for that. You can disable it. Uh, you can disable the completions in, uh, in IDE and just invoke them uh, with the key press. So that, that kind of kind of works. Uh, the suggestions you've seen may be incorrect or irrelevant. It was using the wrong item. It, uh, yeah, it did not use SQLite. Why? Right? And also, the, uh, the, and this is, this is really big. The training data may be outdated. Right? Uh, same for, for the GPT models, but this means that it might suggest older techniques or uh, yeah, previous versions of the libraries that are now obsolete, that may even contain security issues. So, again, you, kinda, you, you can't use it mindlessly yet. But we're getting there. I'm really excited about this. Um, right. So that, that was about Copilot. And now, um, so any questions so far, by the way? Well, uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I, I have it running on, on all my IDs, and those are a lot. I have... Uh, Python, SQL, C Sharp, never Java, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm crap at Java, that's why. Uh, but, but, but yeah, yeah, it, it, so for, for some things, especially for, for re repetitive code, it's brilliant. It's like really fast. But you know, if I were, so, so this costs, again, I, I'm gonna mention cost because uh, not everybody mentions that and I think it's, it's relevant. At $10 a month, I would buy this if GPT wasn't $20 a month. But with, with the latest language models, uh, yeah, you can just get around that. It's, you'll see. Actually, le let me show you. So, um, yeah, let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is an elephant in the room. <laughs> um, let's talk about the, the latest uh, iteration. Let's talk about GPT-4. Before we do that, do you want to play a game? Probably. I'm going to take that as a yes, by the way. So uh, <laughs> these are two photos. One of them is, uh, is real. One of them is generated by an AI. Let's find out which is which. Yeah. That would be funny. But no, 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 no. So take a look. Think for a couple of seconds. And who knows? Should we vote? Who thinks this is generated by an AI? Okay, so I'm going to magically invoke the number 13 people. <laughs> I haven't counted them, but it look, you look like you're 13. And who thinks this one was generated by an AI? You're good. You're, it's definitely more than 30. It's like 14 or 15 even. Right, so, so this was generated by an AI. Why? Why did you say that? The color? Green. The, the, the slice, how... How does gravity work for the slice? Yeah, but, but it's really close, right? So, so this is possible at the moment with, a, uh, with image generation models. And language models aren't far behind, behind right? So at the moment, to the best of my knowledge, uh, GPT-4 is uh, it's kind of the best model out there. It's not the biggest. It's not, it doesn't have the largest context, right? That, that one's Anthropic's uh, Claude. Uh, but people are using it to evaluate other models. That, that's kind of how it works. And uh, it's really good for, for generating code, I found. That, that's actually what I'm using right now to, when I don't know what to do, or even when I don't want to think about what to do, which is like all the time. Uh, right, so, so for this, I wanted to show you a quick demo, if that's okay, a quick live demo, which may, uh, may fail fantastically. But that would be funny, wasn't it? wouldn't it? So uh, right now, what do I have here? I have the code in, in uh, Visual Studio Code, the code for that microservice. So I want to use this GPT. This, this is, by the way, um, 
This is an open source interface. It's called Chatbot UI. You can see that, but oh, you definitely can see that. But it, it's zoomed over here. An open source interface that I'm running locally that is connected to a GPT-4 instance running in the Azure cloud. I'm doing that and not running uh, ChatGPT from OpenAI or whatever because uh, I kind of trust more Microsoft's privacy policy than OpenAI's privacy policy, and I know um, questions entered in the, in the chat GPT UI are analyzed and used to make the product better, and I don't want that. Because I'm selfish, yeah? And because I write poor code and I don't want to be embarrassed, right? So, so I'm using this, it's using an API, the API is running in Asia, right? And it, believe me, it's actually the, the GPT-4. Uh, and now, let's enter that text, and let's, let's ask it, to rewrite the code to use SQLite, because I really want to do that, yeah? So here's uh, Python. My keyboard is crap. Micro, as you'll soon see. This, please change the in mem. It'll, it'll figure it out. Database, it'll figure it out. <laughs> to use SQLite. <laughs> you know, there's a really interesting study done on, on GPT-like models that shows that if, if you talk to it in a certain way, like showing a poor, uh, let's say, literacy, it will start lying to you more often than if you, if you enter the, the right code. And this actually makes sense, right? Because it's an image, it, it's, a, it's a text prediction engine. And you generally get uh, lots of misinformation associated with low literacy. What did it do? I'm really curious. Wow, that's a lot, right? I'm going to pay a lot for those tokens. So updated version of your microservice using, well, it's, it's really polite. I see a lot, of, a lot of selects. I don't want to run those selects, uh, inserts, raw, raw SQL. We've updated a simple. Items DB to store, of course, it's great. Uh, can you review it? It's how good, how, what improvements do you see? Now, it's, it's rather than asking if it sees improvements, it's more efficient also when talking to people. What do you see? Improvements, it ah, doesn't matter. Do you see with your little elf eyes? It will start cursing, I'll tell you. Adding async, boom, context manager. Implement the update item. It didn't implement the update item? Proper response, why? What? It should have created the proper response. The, the issue with these models, right, is that they're not really predictable. So each time, they kind of generate the something else because it's, it's more interesting like that, which is great for a person, but not great for a machine. Right, because we, we're trained to expect reliability. And we don't get, man, that's a lot of code. All right, if you choose to use async, IO SQLite, that, that's a thing. Honestly, I've never used IO SQLite in Python, but this seems legit. Right, so async update item, tusk, tusk. Also implement an ORM, uh, uh, SQL Alchemy, SQL Alchemy. Uh, I'm saying that because I actually want to try to run this code, and I've set the environment for SQL Alchemy, and 50% of the time it will use SQL Alchemy, 50% of the time it will use a tortoise something, which I've never used. So fingers crossed this works. It, that's a lot of code. So. What am I doing now? I'm kind of programming, right? <laughs> well, that, that's what I call myself at work. Yeah. I'm programming, dudes. Let's <laughs> see you later. I'm, right? But I'm using English language to program a machine. A machine that itself results in a program. But isn't it the same when you, when you don't write assembler code, right? When you use a higher level language such as Java, which then gets translated to intermediary, intermediary, IL. And then which gets translated to, the, to machine code isn't the same or really similar. Don't answer that if it's not the same. Right, so 
That's a lot of code, man, updated. Do you want to try this? It might fail. In my tests, 66% of the time, it didn't work. And I've recorded it once, and it worked. But I will not show you that recording, because it's secret. Don't forget to update the item pi class. I, I've installed those. I, whoa, those are more than. Let's not install them and see if it works. If not, it's its fault. So I'm not sure if it's, it's the first time it asks me to actually update an item. Class config, Jesus. How did it know about the item, I wonder? Because I haven't sent it this code. I wonder. Right, so uh, let's see if this works. I have no idea. It, it will probably fail, so let's set our expectations. Let's run. Name optional is not defined. So what I'm going to do, I'm go not going to think about this. I have gave up, gave up on thinking long ago. I'm just going to paste the error here. Optional is not defined. Really curious what, what this does. Think so well. It apologizes. I love this guy. So yes, you do. You have missed something. And, and now it's going to rewrite the whole file. First, the rest of the code. And I have no idea why, why is it this change should resolve the name error. OK, if it, it apologized, so it must be good. So I'm going to paste it again. All right, this seems interesting. And I'm going to, I'm not told you, not going to think about it. This, this import's optional. Am I doing a grave mistake? You know what? Let's just leave it at it as it. Name dependent is not defined. Well, in order to avoid further session is, wow. This is bad, you know. So I'm just, you know, I'm not going to do it. I've quit. <laughs> right. As you can see, right, it can generate code that looks, and mo most likely if I argue with it for 10 more minutes, it'll work. Uh, what I wanted to share, but I won't, but what I wanted to share is uh, you can do a lot right now, right? In 33% of the cases, of course. And you can even ask it, so let's say I, I had a discussion, uh, to review your code, let's say you simulate, simulate van cat. I checked with him and it's cool with this. And review the code again. Right, so you can ask it to simulate certain personalities, which, which of course will make it pay attention to. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> I asked you to simulate it. Nah. Last time it, he was really friendly, so he, th he thought, it thought he was Venkat. Why is he outputting code? I asked it to review the code he generated. Right, so, so as I was saying, uh, you can trust this, guys. Right? Let me get, get back to the presentation. Um, so, so you've seen how to almost change SQLite. I couldn't, couldn't get help from uh, Copilot, but I almost could get help from GPT-4. And uh, recently, I, I, I got this, uh, this great quote by, by Ethan Mollick, which is a professor at Wharton. Uh, I love him. He's really insightful. And basically, uh, he argues that, yeah, we want our software to yield the same results each and every time. Because, you know, if our bank did that, if our bank didn't do that, yeah, we would be, like, really, really upset. But then we, we, we migrate this behavior to large language models as well. And they, they, don't, they just don't work as that. Yeah, they're not reliable. They're not predictable. But they're really useful. Yeah, so, so you can think of them as, well, let's say as an intern. Right, and not just as a high school intern, because with the latest iteration, uh, they, they really get better. But more as a, an intern that you need to tell specifically what to do, and then you'll get, hopefully, the right results. And the more accurate you are when describing what you want to do, the more accurate uh, and you know, predictable the results you get are. Right? So, so, for example, if I had given it some examples or explained what I wanted in, in higher details, this would have worked. It would, not be, it would not have been as funny. Fingers crossed. Right? Uh, 
this, this actually is another thing I wanted to share. It's, it's a list of, um, well, second order effects of AI generating things, right? And I'm gonna focus on AI generating code specifically because I think that's important, right? So initially, yeah, software is easier, it's faster to implement, faster to, to write, but then this means the total quantity of software in the world grows, right? Because there, there are still not enough programmers, even with layoffs, yeah? So many software programs are built on demand, yeah, because it's easier, which means, in turn, that software kind of becomes disposable, right? You, you can just ask a large language model to generate what you want, and if you ask it nice enough, you might also get it, right? Which means... <laughs> you know, have you ever thought I could rewrite this in a weekend and then three months later it's still not ready? Well, soon you might actually be able to rewrite that in a weekend, whatever that is. And honestly, I'm really excited about this. Really, really excited about this. Now, I, I do realize I've prolonged this most beautiful day <laughs> quite a bit. So I, I wanted to, if I can just leave you with one last thing, it would be spiders are everywhere, just watch out. You can never be too careful. Thank you. Uh, before, no, no, no. Thank you. Right, so uh, <laughs> if you want, I'll, I'll uh, post the links for everything I've showed you today. So, so Copilot, the articles, whatever, the, I have a bunch of links. Uh, on bit, bit.ly slash voxed links or on this QR code, which is basically, basically my LinkedIn account. I'll post that either tonight or tomorrow morning, but realistically tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. Been a pleasure. <laughs>